everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, this webinar is also co-hosted co by Open Channels and we'd all like to welcome uh, all of you here today for the webinar and we'd also like to welcome the Ember Human Dimensions Working Group um, and who is going to uh, Alida Bundy is going to be from Fisheries and Oceans Canada is going to be doing most of the presenting but we have a, quite a bit quite a few members of the working group here uh, or with Alida um, who will be answering questions we'd like to welcome them all today and they're going to be presenting on uh, Ember Adapt a decision support tool for responding to global change um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know uh, how they can ask questions. So, um, Alida will present and then we'll have uh, time for question and answer. Uh, there's two ways you can send in questions. You can, well, the first one, you can raise your virtual hand. There's a hand icon in the user interface. Um, you can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask the question directly to the um, the Human Dimensions Working Group um, for someone to answer and that only works if you have a working microphone if you're using the voice over IP option or if you're if you using the telephone if you've entered the PIN number so go ahead and look those up if you plan to use that option otherwise uh, to send in questions you can type the question into the question panel of the user interface and I'll relay it to, to everybody um, and you can go ahead and send in questions throughout the webinar if you like. Um, if there's any clarifying questions, such as what an acronym st stands for, um, I can uh, ask Alan, Alida to clarify while she's presenting. Otherwise, we'll hold the questions till the end of the Q&A period. But you can go ahead, uh, go ahead and send in questions throughout the presentation. Okay. Well, welcome again, everyone. And I'll turn it over to you now, Alida. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, uh, good afternoon, morning, evening, everyone who's joining us. Um, I'm broadcasting this from Berlin in Germany, where we're having our annual working group meeting. So you may be able to hear the bells in the background, because it's just turned 6 o'clock here. So this is a, a product that we've developed together in the Inver Humans Dimensions Working Group. As Sarah said, uh, most of us are here in this room, and uh, we're all going to be here and available to answer questions uh, when we finish the presentation. So I first want to start out by outlining wh why we felt the need to develop um, what we're calling uh, iADAPT or IMBERADAPT iADAPT for short. And just to tell you first of all that, that iADAPT is of course an acronym which stands for assessment based on description and response and appraisal for a typology. And we've designed this specifically as a decision support tool for responding to global change in marine ecosystems. And global change, as we know, is happening now locally, regionally, globally. Um, we see overfishing, we have uh, changing global markets, changing food demand, global warming, ocean acidification, <coughs> invasive species, etc. Lots of change happening. Um, and then knowing how to respond to that change, knowing what kind of managerial responses, governance responses, social responses, etc., to try and respond to that change and address it remains a challenge. And climate change is one of several local ch challenges facing local communities and marine ecosystems, but often there are other issues that are actually more pertinent and more immediate. And so we have to deal with both the short-term challenges as well as longer-term challenges. And fundamentally, there's a lack of a coherent framework uh, which will help identify what coping strategies uh, might work, what's been done elsewhere, and to, to learn what kind of adaptive coping or preventative options might be possible. So we saw a need to develop some sort of learning tool that will help in the decision-making context. So as I've outlined, there are various kind of issues that a decision maker might be faced. And so there are many different options, many different kind of responses one could take. Um, you could introduce new regulations. You could stop whatever activity might be either affected by the problem or causing a problem. There could be a response of developing new technical innovation. There could be changing the management structure. Perhaps co-management might be an option. Or perhaps it's time to look at alternative livelihoods. And these, of course, are just a few of the possible responses. The point is that there's both a, an increasing number of challenges that we're faced with, uh, 
and there is a wide range of responses that might be possible, but there's very little guidance to know what kind of response might make both best sense, both in terms of the, the natural ec ecological systems we're dealing with, in terms of the social systems we're dealing with, and also in terms of the governing system. So how do we help with this problem? Well, one way, of course, is to, to learn what's been done elsewhere. So this is what we've tried to develop with iAdapt. We've developed what we're calling a decision support tool that essentially builds on knowledge learnt elsewhere from past experience of responses to global change to enable decision makers, researchers, managers, local stakeholders to essentially uh, triage, distill the, the kind of responses and, that have been used elsewhere that might improve their own to make decisions efficiently and transition towards marine sustainability. And also to evaluate where to most effectively allocate resources uh, to help address vulnerability and enhance resilience of coastal peoples to change. Our Imber Adapt, I adapt depends on case studies, and in particular, uh, these are case studies based on empirical contextualized studies, um, as you'll see in a minute, de de derived from interdisciplinary teams. We're trying to be global in reach, so we have case studies from around the world, um, but they're, they're case studies that try to capture the differences in the systems um, and, and try to uh, embrace all the different dimensions of ecology, social, culture and governance. So this is what iADAPT looks like conceptually. Uh, it's basically built from three components. We have a, a description of the, uh, the, the issues that are facing the system, the system itself. We have an appraisal of what responses have been tried in this case study. And we have a typology, which essentially is a classification of these different systems, which is a decision maker's tool to help evaluate, to guide their decision making and to, to lead to policy evaluation. And I'm going to explain all these different uh, three different components of iADAPT in a minute. But what this will help the decision maker to do when they're faced with one of these potential range of issues is to um, use IDAP to explore potential responses. And to do this, uh, they need to understand their own situation and uh, develop some key descriptors. Compare to these descriptors to what can be learned from the typology, select case studies uh, that the typology guides them to, learn what responses have worked and why in these particular case studies, and use this to decide on the most appropriate response. And I'm going to explain this all in much more detail over the next few slides. And who will use iADAPT? Well, basically all those who might be involved in decision making, and that might be, you know, in the conventional way, fishery managers, it might also be stakeholders, it could be community groups, we see researchers and students using it, and, and various sorts of decision makers. So we see this as a tool that will be useful at a number of different levels. Now I said at the beginning, and then Sarah introduced us as the IMBER Human Dimensions Working Group, so I just want to spend a couple of moments to introduce you to IMBER. IMBER is an Integrated Marine Biogeochemistry and Ecosystem Research Project. It's uh, in its 10th year now, it began in 2005, and its overall goal is to investigate the sensitivity of marine biogeochemical cycles and ecosystems to global change. It has four research themes, and the fourth of those, which you can see on the right-hand side, is responses to society, or responses of society to global change. So this working group has been formed to address that fourth theme. So we were established in 2010. And the goals of this working group are broadly to promote an understanding of the multiple feedbacks between ocean and human systems and to explore what human institutions can do you know, to adapt to such changes. So, so we interpret this broadly and have, uh, over the last 12, we had a first meeting in 2010, we've uh, been working on developing this iADAPT tool. So there are uh, three aspects of iADAPT that I want to spend some time on in this presentation. The first is the development of iADAPT, uh, both theoretically looking at the case studies and talking a little bit about the development of the apology. I want to talk about its use as a decision support tool. 
And then also its potential use as a research, monitoring and educational tool. So let's look a little bit of the theoretical background. Many of you will be familiar with the idea of, of linked social ecological systems. They come under different guises, human environment systems, human in nature, etc. But the idea is that we can no longer treat the eco ecological ecosystem as a separate system from what's going on in the human system. And there's been quite a lot of work published on this. And the diagram to the right-hand side is one example of many of, of linked social ecological systems. In addition to that, um, We've used uh, what's called the DIPSER or the driver pressure state impact response uh, theory to inform our thinking, which is the idea that, that drivers create pressures which affect the state of a system, which have impacts, and then there are responses required. And then to that, we've also used and, 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 and uh, interpreted quite heavily the interactive governance theory, which may be a bit less familiar to than, than the DIPSER approach. An interactive governance is really about assessing the qualities of the governing systems and also the systems to be governed, which would be the social and the natural systems. So we've incorporated thinking from these three different concepts and used this to um, build an approach to link the natural system, the social system and governing system so that we can fully describe these. So we start and here I've just encapsulated this into NGNS, but recognizing that we consider all three systems in the different aspects I'm going to describe. So we first of all start describing the state of the uh, natural, social and governing systems. This we're using to, um, to describe the case studies that we're collecting to uh, develop iADAPT. We describe the stressors on the three systems, including any external drivers, describe the change that these cause, we look at the impact of the change on these three systems, we describe the capacities of the three system to address the changes, and then describe the response of the system to this change. So that really has structured our thinking around the description of each of these case studies. And we've developed templates, which I'll show you shortly, on uh, listing the kind of questions we've developed to um, get this, uh, draw this information from the case studies. Now the last uh, descriptive part is the response and what we've uh, included in iADAPT and we, we think is quite critical to the learning process is what we're calling the appraisal and we've used a results-based management approach to this meaning simply that um, in the description we ask what the responses were and particularly what the objectives of the response were and so we, we evaluate or appraise that response by first asking where the objectives of the response achieved, which would be the outputs, and then in the longer term, what were the main issues uh, that were described in the description addressed in the longer term, and then also were there any unanticipated side effects. So that's the appraisal component of iADAPT. And then we use the information from the description and the appraisal to develop the typology. And the typology, as I mentioned earlier, is a kind of the, the guide, if you like, for decision makers to learn or to determine which of the case studies uh, might be most useful to inform their decision making need. And then just want to underline that, that, that underneath the description and appraisal, of course, is, is a bill, uh, developing database of case studies which are rich in detail. We only use some of that to develop the typology, but that typology then links back to that database. So as I mentioned, we developed a questionnaire to, um, <coughs> um, to get the information that required from the case studies. Now, we went through several iterations of this. Uh, we started off with over 100 different questions and we structured it very clearly around um, stressors, then we described the natural system, the social system, the governing system, and we learned by trial and error essentially that, that we were being too detailed and that we needed to reduce questions. So the questionnaire that we now have ended up with, we've structured a bit differently. We structured around uh, after having a background information session, section and looking at the stresses and their impacts, we've designed it around ideas of vulnerability and governance. And then we look at the response and appraisal. And we're focused initially on marine fisheries and aquaculture just to constrain our, our problem field. 
And so we've developed our initial conceptual framework using six case studies which have been provided by Inver Human Dimension Group members. Although, as I'll show you shortly, we're in the process of, of um, inviting more case studies to, to further develop by ADAPT. So these are the case studies that we've used. There's only six so far, but six is sufficient to, to develop this concept. And as I say, these are um, from members of the working group. Um, we have from Bulinov Bay an, an oyster case study, from uh, La Coronia Baradachui a uh, clam study, another oyster study from the US West Pacific, a small pelagic case study from southern Benguela, a shrimp study from Tokyo Bay, and um, a, con a tropical reef study from the Spearmond Archipelago in, in Indonesia. So these are a range of case studies, and as you'll see there, with a range of different tissues. So looking at some of the questions that we've asked, uh, we first of all start with the, after describing the background, giving some background information about the case study and asking some specific questions about the stressors of the systems, we have vulnerability questions. So we ask questions such as, what is the productivity of the system? Um, what is the ecological status of the affected system? We look at what, ask questions about the, the main stressors, of the ecological system. And then we look at some social questions such as the size of the affected human population, what the main livelihood activities are, alternative livelihood activities. The idea here is in terms of vulnerability, are there other occupations that people could move to if their own occupation is affected by the main issue, for example? Um, how much of the catch is used for household consumption? Again, getting ideas of vulnerability and the same with the income. And then we have a series of questions about governability. Uh, what is the scale of the issue? What is the relationship between different sectors? For example, is there a lot of conflict or is there a lot of cooperation? Um, we get aspects of equity and social power. Is there a dominant sector or is uh, distribution of power? Um, are there structural changes in the governing organizations, meaning are they flexible? We also ask, of course, about management measures such as key rules and regulations. And again, whether there's any flexibility, do those uh, rules and regulations change over time? And whether informal rules might be an important uh, role in the governance of fisheries or aquaculture. So these are getting at the ideas of governability. We then ask a series of questions uh, about what was the response. So how did these different systems, the natural, social and governing, respond to the main issue in the short term? And then we ask the same question for the long term, because of course there is a time-dependent response, um, and what works, or sorry, what may be achieved in the longer term may require a different kind of short-term response. And then we ask uh, what kind of factors may have contributed to successful results, and what factors may have prevented results from being fully achieved. And then finally, in the appraisal, um, we ask, we, we're trying to here evaluate what worked and what didn't work, and, and then why. Um, so were the results of the response uh, for the natural, social and governing systems achieved in the short and long term? Was the main issue addressed? Has there been a formal evaluation of the response? And if so, what were the benefits and costs? And were other options considered? So the idea of all these questions is to, to describe the, the case study, the issues, uh, the different systems in enough detail to be informative to decision makers and also so that we can distill information to use in the typology. When we analyze the case study questions for the typology, um, we use most of the questions but not all and we uh, evaluate these on, on a five-point scale. Um, so, for example, one of the questions is what is the ecological status of the affected ecosystem? And so we evaluate this from severely degraded to good based on the responses provided in the case study templates. And similarly, we ask a question about what is the mode of governance? And that might be self-governance, co-governance, and range up to some sort of hierarchical governance across, across different levels. And so this is a categorical scale. Some of the questions uh, range from good to bad. Some are simply descriptive, as in the example on the right-hand side. So in developing the typology, um, we've used um, 
basically a, a, a cluster analysis technique uh, using multi-factor analysis on these five categorical variables for each case study. So these are the six case studies plotted here along the, the, the main axes from this uh, multi-factor analysis. And for the statisticians amongst you, you can see that this accounts for almost, well, in fact, about 50% of the variation in the data. Now, there's only six case studies, and we recognize that, that this is, is obviously not a, a full typology and will change as because this is not a sufficient number to fully describe the data. But again, this is a proof of concept. So the six case studies, just to remind you, um, have been here you can see that they're split into three clusters. On the top left we have Tokyo Bay, um, the French oyster study and the US oyster studies from the west coast. In the top right we have a clam study from, from uh, Uruguay and in the bottom middle we have the Indonesian tropical reef study and the South African small pelagic studies and these have been separated into clusters which is what we hope the typology will do of course. Now where the learning tool comes in is to evaluate what, what separates these clusters along these dimensions. And so the questions that separated the Uruguayan Quash clam study showed that, that the governance level was more at the local scale, there was participatory management and strong co-management. So these were the, the, the questions that had most influence on separating that study out from the other two. In the top left-hand corner, the shrimp and the oyster studies, uh, governance was more at the national scale, the ecosystems were already uh, degraded with low productivity, uh, the governance level is diversity of, some diversity of key rules and some informal, uh, and, and some informal rules. And then what separated the, the Indonesian reef study and African, sorry, South African small pelagics is that there was more informal governance, some coercion between sectors and poor ecological status. Now again, this is a very pre preliminary, preliminary analysis. Um, but the idea here is to convey the idea by, that by taking the questions from the case studies, scoring them on this five-point categorical scale, we can begin to learn about their differences. And then with more when we have more case studies, what we will do is then map on the success of the responses onto this figure um, and show or be able to evaluate uh, where we see successful responses, what kind of uh, conditions led to that response, uh, what, what were the uh, conditions under the governance and vulnerability uh, questions that we ask in the templates and how do they map onto these different clusters. We could do it with six case studies, it wouldn't tell us very much. We have to wait until we've gathered more uh, to be able to use that in an effective way. But we can draw some preliminary conclusions from this work. Um, one is that clearly we can resolve these different case studies into types uh, based on our, our process. And to underscore that, the typology basically provides a first order entry point. It allows a, a user to, to identify um, and compare different marine social ecological uh, issues, crises to identify solutions uh, which may or may not have worked elsewhere. So it guides the user to a more detailed underlying database. We can draw some simple information from some of these case studies too. Um, one of which was often a short-term response was more research, which is an interesting result because that means that, well, in many cases more research, but it also cries to the need for more information and that also points to why this kind of approach could be useful as a learning tool because as, as time goes by and we have more case studies as part of this iADAPT, then although research will still be an issue, there will be more other examples to learn from. Um, often it was too early to evaluate the effectors of long of long-term responses and often few if any alternative responses were considered, which I think is also an interesting uh, interesting result to come out of this. And often no evaluation of the effectiveness of responses. Again, um, we need to learn from what we're doing. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that we are in the process of expanding this typology, and uh, for the last couple of years, we have been uh, inviting a variety of our colleagues, peers, etc., to join us in this exercise. And so, uh, we have an increasing number of case studies that we're currently scoring and evaluating, and that's some of the work we've been doing at our meeting this week. And we hope to be able to develop a, a new, more informative typology in, in the short to, to near future. And in fact, one of our members will pre be presenting some further results from this at the MARI conference uh, in a couple of months. So as noted, um, we, we're gathering more case studies, um, inviting more, more of our colleagues, etc., to join us. So we want to fully explore this vul vulnerability, governability, and response space. And then, as I mentioned, we want to try and map the appraisal results under the typology. What conditions lead to successful responses? And if we can start to dig into that kind of information, this could be an extremely useful tool. Uh, we have published on this. Uh, there's a paper that, that's online in Fishing Fisheries, uh, which basically a bit more detail outlines our, our theoretical and conceptual development and gives the the preliminary results. So I certainly invite you to take a look at this. And uh, if you're if you don't have a copy and would like one, uh, it's you can write to any one of us, or it's on the Ember website. And I want to just this is all very conceptual and theoretical, but how would someone actually use this? So again, we start we start with our key descriptors as we've just described. So you would use the questionnaire template to describe the system and the issues that you're facing. So we have the questions that we, we've just uh, described. Use that then to interrogate the IADAPT typology of case studies and find out which case studies have similar issues and characteristics to, to that of yours. Pretend you're the decision maker facing this crisis. Can use those case studies to find out what types of responses worked, uh, what worked, what didn't work, why it worked, and obviously looking then at the sort of social, the governing, and the natural uh, systems context that are described. And then, as I say, there's this large and growing database under, uh, underneath the typology where there is more detailed information. As I say, only a subset of the questions and information is used to develop the typology, the richness of details in this underlying database. Oops, wrong button. Um, and then with that additional information, um, this will be a guide to, to determine the applicability of, of those case studies to the current, current problem and situation that you're dealing with. And this can be used then to identify what kind of research strategy might be required if further research is required, to identify short-term response for the social and governing systems, and perhaps even some long-term responses. And just to underscore, of course, that it's important to monitor response, to evaluate response, and the Ember template can be also used for that purpose, to monitoring what's happened as a result of any response that the, the decision makers have agreed upon. So there are, that's a sort of development and the conceptual thinking behind Ember Adapt with a little bit on how the decision makers might use it. We also see its value as a research tool. And this is, um, so rather than being a single decision maker going in and, and, and trying to evaluate what kind of responses might be appropriate for his or her uh, particular system, we can also use this as researchers uh, to use the typology of case studies to, to start to explore what conditions lead to successful responses to global change. What are the different contexts in the natural, social, and governing context that are either, either promote successful responses or indeed the, the opposite um, are, are factors that hinder those successful responses. And fundamentally, what types of responses actually address the issues being faced? Uh, not, not just whether the, the response meet their initial objectives, but whether in fact those responses are the right ones to address the main issues. We also see this as a valuable monitoring tool and also potentially is for developing capacity in communities because again it's a tool that can be brought to the, the community at the moment. We've used it in a way of um, 
we, we've asked researchers, etc., to, to fill out our templates on the basis of, of research that's already been done. But this IADAP could also be taken into communities to start baseline monitoring and to teach uh, those in communities or work with those in communities to further their the capacity to, in fact, uh, do their own monitoring and research. And equally, it can be used as an educational tool in, in universities with, with students who are interested in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. So we see it has multiple uses and um, it has um, the potential to, for research, monitoring and education. So in terms of next steps, um, clearly our working group is, is actively working on this, um, but we also would invite further case studies uh, to enable us to, to further develop iADAPT and would love to have an opportunity to join with others who may be interested in what we're doing. Uh, there are several ways to do that by um, bringing your, your case study and working with us on that, participating in some of the analyses we're doing. If you're in the decision-making capacity, it'd be great to let us know what, what you think you need, uh, would be needed. Are, are we hitting on the right buttons or perhaps there are things that we've missed? Um, if you're already involved in training programs, perhaps this would be an opportunity to bring in a tool that explicitly links this natural social and governing systems, which is um, more and more realized as a, a, a needed methodological approach. Um, and ultimately helping to, to develop local past capacity for global response. We, we are going to continue to apply and, and test and hopefully validate, validate iADAPT over the, the near to longer term. Our, our more immediate next step is uh, in the process of preparing a book uh, detailing the case studies and lesson learned from them and that's the list of case studies that I showed you earlier. So finally then, I would just like to acknowledge all the people who have already uh, joined us in this exercise at providing case studies. Um, I would like to say that we do have a page about the working group and the work that we're doing at the IMBA website, so I would invite you to go there. And I just again want to acknowledge all the, the, the working group members that picked, as I said, we're in Berlin, that is the Berlin Wall, dividing East and West Berlin, which we visited last night. Um, so those are the people that you that are here. I'll start at the front. Omar Defio, Ratna Chumpagdi, Bernard Glaser, Yinji Lee, Patrice Giatro, myself, Moniba Isaacs, Ian Perry, and the floating head is not a piece of graffiti, that's Eddie Allison, who unfortunately couldn't join us. And then Sarah Cooley and Misa Sako Makino have also been are also associate members and previous members of the group and were part of our initial thinking on this. And with that, I thank you and uh, look forward to some questions. And remember, we're all here, so you can address questions to any one of us. Thank you. Okay, Alida, thank you so much. Um, I see Eddie. So, Eddie, I'll go ahead and unmute you. Um, and if you want to mute yourself, Eddie, uh, go ahead. Uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. Again, there's two ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand. That's the little hand icon on user interface. And uh, I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to the working group. Or you could type the question into the question panel of your user interface and I'll relay it. Um, so go ahead and send in questions now. Let's see. We had one. Um, uh, Hugo sent in. It says, I don't see any economic valuation studies. Uh, why is that? Um, just because one of the most direct impacts on ecosystems is economic pressure. Okay, so the problem with this setup, Sarah, is that my working group meters, members here can't hear the questions. Oh, um, are you able to relay it to them? I wonder. Um, Maniba is going to unmute her computer and see if we can do it that way. Because this is a question, for example, that Patrice, who's our resident economist, would be a great person to answer. Okay. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, are you ready? Should yeah. I repeat it now? Right. Yeah, would you re repeat? Sure. Would you repeat the question, please? 
Sure. This question is coming from Hugo, uh, and it says, I don't see any economic valuation studies. Why is that? One of the most important direct impacts on ecosystems is economic pressure. Okay. Okay, Patrice now has earbuds in. I'm sorry, Sarah, this is a little bit confusing, but uh, so Patrice now has earbuds in, so he'll listen to the question directly. Okay. Okay. Um, again, a question from Hugo. Uh, I don't see any economic valuation studies. Why is that? One of the most direct impacts on ecosystems is economic pressure. Okay. Well, yes, thank you for the questions first. Um, yeah, I agree with you. We absolutely agree with you. But we think that uh, we included some of these um, economic questions and drivers in the social part of the questionnaire, the embedded app. So it's not totally absent. And the way we uh, post coding, because we've uh, been doing a work for the last few days about post coding this questionnaire in order to prepare the typology uh, uh, um, work. And uh, we we try as far as possible to estimate the cost, the sort of cost benefit analysis, including social cost and private cost uh, of the measures, the response that have been taken, and the benefits uh, and outcomes uh, out of it. So uh, we definitely we we're included. We're including these uh, economic features and drivers uh, as stressors among among others. Did I okay. answer yes. correct, yeah. correctly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Patrice. Thank um, you. I had a question, a practical question, like about how long does it take to enter a case study for for those thinking about doing so? Sorry, I missed the beginning of that question. We were transferring about, headsets. Oh, sorry. About how much time does it take to add a case study for those who are interested in adding a case study? Oh, okay, good. That's a great question. So the question was, how much time does it take to add a case study for those who might be interested in adding a case study? Mm -hmm. Well, when we first set our questionnaire around, when there was about 100 questions, apparently it took much too long. So we now have a set of 30 questions. And I think there's two answers to this question. One is that the, the questionnaire is best filled out by not just one person, but by a uh, perhaps uh, um, a team of people who have expertise in the governance, social and ecological systems. Um, I think it can, we, we have a range of responses to that. Uh, for a well-studied system with a, an ongoing research project, probably a couple of hours. For, res for other systems which might require a bit more collection of data, um, perhaps a day or two. Um, it, the, at this point, our intent is not to go out and do primary research. The idea was to collect information and use information from case studies of systems that have already been studied. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Thank you, Alida. Um, and. Um, there was a follow-up question for Patrice, if you wanted to okay. switch over to... Follow-up question for Patrice, so I'm going to turn the headphones back to him. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Patrice. Patrice. Okay. Hi. This was a follow-up question from Hugo. Uh, what kind of economic approach do you use? Uh, the classical economics or ecological economics? Uh, I don't think we have enough materials to conduct any ecological economics. Well, unless, of course, as Alida said, that we are using all the information to uh, um, to fill up the the forms. So, uh, including the literature we have on the case study, and possibly among this literature, we have uh, some economic analysis, proper economics. So, whether it comes from um, ecological economics or classical economics, I would say, uh, it will uh, give a, a different information, of course, to the case study, including more uh, the biological functions and growth functions, for instance, inside the economic models itself. But as far as the, uh, the appraisal is concerned, I was talking about this cost-benefit analysis. So it's more dealing with classical uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis than ecological uh, analysis, I would say. Ecological economics analysis. Did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, uh, okay. Thank you, Patrice. And let's see. Uh, Alda, you back on? I'm back. Yep. 
Okay, I, did, I had a, another question. Um, how do you ex do you expect the typology results, the analysis, uh, to change once you add more case studies? Yes, certainly at the moment, because at the moment we only have six case studies. So yes, of course we'd expect the typology to change, um, and it will continue to change uh, for as as we gather more case studies. But eventually, depending on how many we can collect, eventually it will stabilize. Um, and that, this is one of the reasons why we're focusing largely on f fishing and aquaculture because if we were to include all sorts of uh, global change issues including terrestrial, including for example uh, coastal zone issues etc then I don't think that typology would ever stabilize because there's too much variation in that problem so by focusing on fishing and aquaculture then I think we will eventually get to a point where adding a case study won't fundamentally change the, the, the results of the typology. Um, of course, one of our intents as we uh, use more case studies to, to develop typology is to explore the robustness of that typology to additional data. And not just to additional data, also to you know what happens if we um, exclude some questions, what happens if we uh, were to include some additional information that, that perhaps um, in response to this seminar or to other uh, opportunities to present results we, we learn that in fact there's a, another dimension that would really add value to what we're doing. So it is an ongoing process um, but the idea certainly is in the future to develop a, a typology that is relatively robust and then can be used uh, by decision makers in, in the way that we described. Okay, thank you, Alida. Um, I also, uh, let's see, another question has come in. Um, information to support responses will not only be scientific uh, published material, but also traditional knowledge or unpublished material. How mm. do you deal with those sorts of resources? Thanks. Right, All right, that's a great question too. Um, and again, there's a two-part response to that. Um, some of some of the, the research that is already being done already incorporates traditional knowledge, uh, local knowledge, etc. And so where that's already been incorporated, incorporated that would um, already be fed into the typology because that would be distilled by the researchers into um, the response to the various questions that we ask in the template, particularly in amongst the, the social questions. Further, um, I just briefly touched on this towards the end, this idea of using the IADAP template as a, as a monitoring tool and bring it into communities um, to, to collect baseline information. Eventually, that, that also information from that will also be incorporated into the typology. So in situations where there is um, a, a, um, an opportunity to incorporate that local knowledge then in fact it could be com completely produced by, by local communities it doesn't just have to be based on scientific research so we see this as a, a very much an interdisciplinary tool which uses information that can be anything from um, information collected by communities through to the traditional researcher role so as I think at the moment Yes, I'm trying to think whether any of our case studies at the moment specifically include traditional knowledge. And I don't think so, but it would be actually a really nice opportunity to explore that dimension um, if, if uh, the, question, the questioner or, or someone else has, has an, an idea of some case studies to, to, to look at in this, through the lens of this um, IADAP template. Okay, great. Um, well, hopefully they'll get in touch. Let's see. Another question that's come in. How is interpretation coding of case studies standardized? Do individual researchers enter their own case, entering their own case studies assign codes, or does your team interpret the responses to address inner coder reliability across case studies? All right, that's another great question. That's something that we've been actually discussing this week. So just for the benefit of uh, my colleagues here, the question was about how do we code the questions? How do we make sure it's standardized? Do we ask the, the people filling out the, the questionnaires, including our templates, to do it? And we backed and forth on that a bit because, um, so at the moment, as I explained, that um, we, we do the scoring. So for almost all of the questions, 
uh, we have a narrative response that's text, and we've developed a scoring scheme, of a simple five-point scoring, sc scoring scheme. And we've tried to make that as um, objective as possible. And what, one of the exercises that we've been doing this week is to um, th that list of new templates that are new uh, case studies that I, I presented. We've been going through those and scoring them, and then comparing the scores by different individuals. And where those scores are different, we try to understand why, because it means either that that the uh, questions are um, being interpreted differently by the different people scoring it or that our, perhaps our scoring scheme is still ambiguous. So we've been trying to make our scoring scheme objective but we've also been well, discussing the idea of whether we shouldn't actually do um, or ask the people completing the questionnaire to score their own answers. Um, and we could do it in the form of a, a question, does this condition presents itself, yes or no, and then ask for a textual response. So it's an important question, and it's a trade-off between um, do we lose information by doing that, or should we have it as a two-part process? So should we score it and then send it back to the people filling out the questionnaires, which is also something we've considered. And then there's also the time it takes to do that scoring process. And, um, you know, this Inver Human Dimensions Working Group, we get uh, um, an opportunity to meet once a year, but we all have our regular fisheries or our regular scientific jobs. Um, and so it's, it's a, a lot of work to do the scoring. So a long answer to say that basically we're doing it ourselves at the moment. We're trying to make it objective, uh, but we are thinking of ways that we might try to streamline the process. And as a corollary to all that, um, I should also say that we are... Um, Ex or we are planning to explore putting our, our questionnaire template, it is already online and downloadable as a PDF, but we're exploring the idea of having it up as perhaps a Google Doc so people can actually complete the template online. And as we're doing that, we're also going to think of whether or not there are some questions that we can actually have the the persons filling out that questionnaire perhaps complete in more of a sort of five categorical response, again with a, a textual narrative explanation. Long answer, sorry, but. Okay, thank you, Alana. Um, let's see. And I, so we have a comment from Eddie, and I'm going to see if I can copy it and paste it into <laughs> the chat and send to everyone. Um, because it contains a link people might want to see. Okay, but I did have one other question in the meantime. Um, are there any models of this sort of uh, case study typology that you are basing it off of and like how how many case studies did they end up having and how widely were they used? Were there, are there any examples of this sort of thing being done before? Are you... Hmm. Okay, so the question is about whether there's any kind of examples of this kind of work being done before where typologies have been developed from case studies. Um, yes, there was some work done um, by the LOIX working group what, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, there's a paper produced in the early 90s by Budenheimer, Budenmeier, and, uh, but that was not and inter interdisciplinary studies, including the social and governing system, that is purely on the physical systems. Um, I'm looking around the room to see if anyone knows of any studies, typologies built from case studies which are um, trans well, interdisciplinary in a way that we've been approaching this, and I'm not seeing any nodding heads. So it's not that we know of, um, but we'd certainly be interested, very interested to find out if there are. Okay. Well, thank you. And that's, that's great. Well, it's great to learn you're na breaking new br ground. And so uh, hopefully this will see a lot of use. And uh, Nick um, from Open Channels has posted uh, Eddie's comment uh, in the chat box, so everyone should be able to see that, yeah. including the link. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a recent paper by Anderson et al. Um, on fishery performance indicators. Um, I think the difference between that work and this is that that is based on indicators, um, whereas we're taking textual information and, and narrative information, which an indicator um, is a very useful tool, in fact something we've discussed about this week too, and this is a very interesting study. 
Um, and, and I do hope people will go and look at it. But what, the typology that we're developing and the specifically the we, we feel quite strongly that the, the rich database that the typology is built from is a, is a very good resource for learning about responses. So the fishery performance indicators will are, are an excellent selection of indicators for describing systems. But as I say, we're also interested in response and, and how responses um, work or how, how successful responses are and how that's grounded in the, the natural, social and governing contexts. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alida. We don't have any more questions. If anybody did want to ask one, get it in really quick. Um, but thank you, thank you all. We really g appreciate you guys taking time out of your uh, your the Ember meeting to do this because um, I, I know how valuable your time is there. Um, but we really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was it was an, it's it's very interesting work, and so we we look forward to tracking its progress. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for the opportunity to present this uh, to your network. Uh, we were very pleased to receive the invitation, and we certainly hope that, that some of those, uh, well, many of those listening in uh, found this useful and interesting. We'd love to hear from anyone that, that, that does. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone.